All righty. It's uh, time to start, I think. So um, this talk is called Building Confidence in Concurrent Code Using a Model Checker, a.k.a. TLA Plus for Programmers. It's a bit of a mouthful. Hopefully, by the end of the talk, um, you will see what I'm talking about. <clears throat> now, um, I'm Scott Voloshin. You probably know me from my functional programming talks and also from my domain modeling talks. Um, this is nothing to do with that. This is all about having confidence, how you test your code. It's not testing code, but how do you have confidence in your designs? So I actually I'm going to ask you in a minute about confidence. I'm going to be testing your ability to look at code and see whether it's right or not. So there is a poll. I'll show this link later on, but uh, hopefully you had a chance to look at it, but I will show a big a version in a, in, in a few minutes. It's bit.ly slash TLA poll 2023. <coughs> right, okay. So why am I focusing on concurrent code in particular? That's because there's two groups of people. There's people who write concurrent code and people who've had painful bugs in concurrent code. And of course, this is actually a perfect circle because concurrent code is horrible. Anyone's actually done anything with concurrent code. It's, not, it's really nasty stuff. So <clears throat> um, this talk is really about confidence, right? How do, you, how do you increase your confidence in your code? And what tools can you use to increase your confidence, right? So there's a toolbox of tools that we use. I mean, the classic one is to do code review or code inspection, right? I look at your code. It's nice to get another pair of eyeballs on your code and make sure it's looking good. I really like static typing. That eliminates a lot of stuff at compile time. It's kind of like compile time unit tests, really nice. Um, I'm also a big fan of property-based testing. That's a great way to increase your confidence in the code. Uh, things like TDD, all the classic techniques, you know, it's all about <coughs> increasing the confidence in your code. And this talk is about this thing called model checking, which is probably, for most of you, a brand new concept. So that's what this talk is about. It's a whole new tool to add to your toolbox. Now, what do I mean by model checking? Well, what's a model? So a model is a tool for thinking. So before I spend a lot of money building a building, for example, I might make a model of the building. <clears throat> and I can use the model to make sure I'm happy with the way it looks and I haven't kind of forgotten anything. And I can show it to other people and get feedback. So models are a way to make sure that you're doing the right thing before you spend a lot of money building the massive building, right? So it's just a way of making sure stuff makes sense before you do more something which is much more expensive. So model checking that I'm talking about is, again, you create a model of your code. You don't actually write the code. You create a model of the code before you do it, and then you check the model. <coughs> and the kinds of things you check are all the constraints met. You know, does anything weird happen when you check the model? Um, especially if you're doing concurrent code, you know, does it deadlock? Does it ever finish? Does it reach a state that you expect to reach? All that kind of stuff. So we're checking the model before we even write the real code. <clears throat> so this is part of formal methods. Formal methods is kind of mathematical approach to, to code quality. Um, this is actually the very easy one. This is like the simplest intro to all this stuff. So there's a couple of model checkers you can use. There's actually a whole bunch of them, but the, the two most popular ones is something called TLA plus, which is actually a whole system, uh, and TLC is the actual model checker within. And I'm not even going to get into all the other stuff in TLA plus. I'm just going to focus this in one thing, and it focuses really on temporal property, something to do with time. Okay, so it's great for doing concurrent systems. Now, there's another one which is quite popular called Alloy, and that's much better on kind of relational logic and and and, and relationships between structures and so on. So that's also very good, but in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on TLA because of the the benefit it has in, in modeling concurrent systems. Okay. <clears throat> so at the end of this talk, you'll know something about TLA plus. So this is what TLA plus code looks like. And you know, it looks weird, right? I um, mean, this is the weirdest looking programming language that you know I've ever seen. When I first saw this, this is a strange programming language. Well, the reason it's a strange programming language is because it's not a programming language, right? It's not a programming language. It's a modeling language. It's a, it's a DSL for modeling states and time. So you might look at this and think this is kind of weird, <clears throat> but hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll be able to look at this and not think it's weird. So that's the goal of this talk. Now, obviously, in one talk, you can't really become an expert, just like in any programming language, you can't you know, learn it in, a, in, a few, in an hour. But if, if the point of this talk is demystify this to just take some of the, uh, the, the fear around using a tool like this. And so it's actually not that hard to use and it's worth spending a bit of time learning. So let's do some first live poll. Here is the live poll I'm going to use, and let me get this started. 
Right. So the first, uh, hopefully everyone has got this up now. It's bit.ly slash TLA poll 2023. Oh, there's the big QR code here. <coughs> and I'll show this again later on if you didn't quite get it. But let's just see what the results are. 100% of people can see this poll. Excellent. So nobody said no. That was very nice. OK, so this poll seems to be working pretty well. OK, good. Oh, some people say no. <laughs> some people are just mean, OK. Or they don't know how to use the internet. Right, OK. So some people are not going to be very good here. OK, so okay, that's the poll. Right, so I'm going to be asking you later on some more serious questions. So the talk, this talk is basically going to start about, I'm going to have some stuff about confidence, and then I'm going to introduce TLA+. I'm going to show you all that syntax and, and show you that it's not as weird as it looks. And then I'm going to run through three examples. First of all, I'm going to do a really, really simple model, which is counting to three. Hopefully, that will be pretty simple. Then I'll actually do a very classic producer-consumer model, <coughs> where they talk to each other through a queue. And then I'll actually do something which is kind of relevant to what we actually do, which is maybe a zero downtime deployment. So we're in charge of deploying some servers, and you want to make sure you have zero downtime. What algorithm should you use to do that? And if you mess it up, you're going to have downtime. So it's kind of important. OK, so let's start with confidence. So I'm going to show you a non-concurrent algorithm. This is just a regular old sort algorithm. It's a sort a list. Um, this is the algorithm that we're going to use. If the list is empty or has one element, it's sorted. We're done. Otherwise, we take the first element, which I'm calling the pivot, and I'm dividing the rest of the list into two piles, one smaller than the pivot, one's bigger than the pivot. And then I take these two piles and I sort them using the same algorithm. And then I combine the whole thing and I put the, sm the sorted smaller list and then I have my pivot and then I have the bigger sorted list. Okay, so that's how I'm going to sort a list. Okay? So do you have confidence that this algorithm is correct? Not, the, not in implementation, but this algorithm. Is this, is this a correct... If I, if I then write this code, am I gonna, is it going to work? Okay, that's my, my check for you. So that's my first poll question. What is the confidence in the design of this algorithm? It's basically a quick sort kind of algorithm. It's not really a quick sort, but it's you know, a recursive sorting algorithm. Hopefully, you've seen this kind of thing before. Now, <clears throat> you should have 100% confidence one way or the other, whether it works, because the code's right in front of you. And it's only you know, 10 lines of code. So if you don't all have 100% confidence, I'm going to be very upset. And we have a mixture between people who are confident, people who are not confident, and people who aren't confident either way. And uh, this is very interesting. So. For the people who are, not, who are not confident either way, what could I do to make you more confident? Right? What kinds of things could I do? And if you thought it wasn't confident, if you, if you were thought it wasn't correct, what could I do to prove that it was correct? Or if it was correct, what could I do to prove that it wasn't correct? Okay? So the fact that it's not 100% in this room, you know, it's, it's, typical, it's typical. People are not very confident about their code. <coughs> So actually that's, actually, that's actually a bug. So all of the people who said this was right, you're not right, there's a bug here. And the bug is actually should be, uh, I had strictly less than, strictly greater than, it should be greater or equal or less than equal, because I'm throwing away duplicate pivots. So there's a little bug, which you didn't catch. So how would you catch the bug like that? Well, one thing is code review. I mean, I could go and say, so you forgot to do the, you know, the less than, uh, you made it too strict. Another way is to do an implementation. I, you know, I write this code in Python or JavaScript or something, and I test it. I'm a big fan of using property-based tests because that would catch it pretty straight away, I'm pretty sure. Rather than just unit tests, you might not catch it because you might forget to put duplicates in, but a property-based test would probably catch it straight away. Or you could actually prove it using a mathematical proof assistant, which nobody, no programmer would ever do that, as far as I know. So personally, I'd use a combination of both. I'd have somebody else eyeball it, make sure they're happy, and then I'd probably write some property-based tests. And if you want to know what property-based tests are, I have a whole talk about that. If you go to f sharp of profit slash pbt, and I'll have that link up later on as well. Now, that was, that was a, a non-concurrent algorithm, and it, we still had a big difference. Now let's talk about concurrency. How confident are you when concurrency is involved? All right, so I'm going to give you a concurrent uh, thing. So this is a very simple 
producer consumer system, we have a queue and we have a producer that writes the queue. And the producer logic is, I'm going to see if the queue is not full. And if it's not full, then I can write to it. But if it's full, I don't want to write, you know, it's a, it's a bounded queue. <coughs> and then we have a consumer that's reading from the queue. And they're going to say, well, if the queue is not empty, then I can read from it. But if it is empty, I'm just going to wait. And they're just going to loop around. The producers and consumers are going to be looping around. Okay? So that's the system. Okay, so here's the complete spec. We have a bounded queue. We have a producer and a consumer. And it's really important that we never read from an empty queue or write to a full queue. We don't underflow or overflow. And let's say the whole system's going to crash and bring down Azure, for example. <coughs> so here's the spec. And here is the consumer spec. So again, the algorithm is really simple. I mean, it's actually simpler than the sort algorithm. Who thinks this is a correct design? How many There's one producer and one consumer. Yeah. And it's a trap. It's a trick question. It's always a trick question when it's concurrency. All right. So try that poll and tell me uh, if you think this is a correct, yeah, so for one producer, one consumer, and later on we'll talk about more than one and more than two, but for, for one producer, one consumer, is this the correct algorithm to use? Let's see what people say here. Oh, okay. We have a big difference of opinion here. And what's interesting is that most people are not confident. <laughs> now, how, this is really simple. I mean, how much simpler could you get? It just got, you know, there's like two lines, two or three lines of code for the producer, two or three lines of code for the consumer. They're both running at the same time, and nobody's confident that this code works. Like a whole bunch of people are not. And <clears throat> the people who, you know, there's a big split between the correct people and the incorrect people. So who's right and who's wrong? And for people who are not confident, how could I persuade you, you know, I mean, I'd say, let's say I say this is absolutely right. I'm really confident this is right. How would I persuade you that I was, you know, that I was right? I mean, you don't want to run it in production because you might not show up in production. <coughs> so we're going to revisit this one in a minute. And um, we'll actually model it in TLA and we'll actually get an answer. So like I say, if you voted not sure, how would I persuade you? Now, let's change it up and have two producers and two consumers. So with one producer and one consumer, and we'll go to the next poll question now. Um, with, with one producer, one consumer, it was 50-50 split between correct and incorrect, and there's a whole bunch of people who weren't sure. And now we've changed it to two. So has people's opinion changed? <clears throat> Let's see. Ah, a lot of people are confident that it's not correct. OK, so anytime there's more than one thing, you know that it's not going to work. <laughs> okay. And there are, a lot of, there are quite a few people who are not confident either way. But people, it's, it's people are very suspicious, like, I don't think this is going to work because it's somehow it's multi-user and there's concurrency, and it's like, I just know it's not going to work. Right, so people are scared. People are scared of concurrent systems, especially when there's a lot of stuff going on. OK, so. Um, People who are not sure, how could I persuade you that it didn't work or did work? Now, the people who thought it didn't work, this is the big thing. So I say, I have a fix for it. I'm going to use atomic, atomic operations. I'm going to use semaphores. I'm going to use a lock. I'm going to use whatever, right? And I present to you my fix for this problem. How, how would I persuade you that my fix was correct? Would you just say, I never trust it? You know, I'm just like never going to believe it's going to work? What could I do to give you confidence and say, yeah, actually, your fix, I'm pretty sure that I'm really confident that your fix is going to work and we can deploy this to production? What would I have to tell you? Okay? So it's, it's hard. Being, being confident in consistency is a really hard problem. Now, the tools that we normally use don't work. So if I do code review and inspection, I mean, you're looking at the code. We have a whole bunch of people looking at the code. I don't think our human brains are very good in concurrency. We, we, our intuition is just rubbish. So that's not going to work. If I create an implementation and then test it, that's not very good either, because a lot of subtle concurrency errors don't show up in testing, and they don't show up in development. They show up in production, when you have millions of things and there's a very high load, and it always happens on the worst day of the year. You know. So just running it is not a very good way of doing it either. So the answer is to use a mathematical proof assistant tool, but that's too much uh, mathematics. We're going to use a model checker. That's what we're going to do. 
So I'm going to revisit this problem again with the model checker, and we'll see for ourselves whether it works. So time to talk about TLA+. Plus. This is the tool we're going to use to model this. And um, again, I'm going to whiz through this very quickly. It's a very short, I mean, it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a quick talk, but hopefully it's going to just demystify it. You don't have to worry about the syntax too much. <clears throat> and stand back, because I'm actually going to use mathematics, so be careful. And that's because it's not a programming language. It's a, it's a mathematical-based model. So TLA Plus was designed by Leslie Lampert, who you might have heard of. He had a famous time and clocks paper in distributed programming. He, he invented the Paxos algorithm. He's a Turing Award winner. And relevant to this, he is the initial developer of LaTeX. Here he is, a picture. And the reason why that's important is because TLA Plus is, uses LaTeX kind of syntax. It's designed to be formatted by LaTeX into papers, computer science papers. It's not designed to be a programming language, which is why it kind of looks weird. So if you know LaTeX, the syntax will be fine. But if you don't know LaTeX, it won't. So what does TLA plus stand for? It stands for Temporal Logic of Actions Plus. All right, what does that mean? Logic. So logic is something to do with Booleans. Hopefully, you know how to use Booleans, so that's good. Temporal is something to do with time. And actions in this thing is going to be transitions in a state machine. So as you move from one state to another, that is an action or a transition. So TLA actually stands for Boolean logic of state transitions over time. Now, that's, that's a little bit less scary. And we're going to kind of dive into that in a minute. And then there's some other stuff which we'll talk about later on. So let's look at the logic in TLA. So Boolean logic is what it is. And um, it's and, and, or, and not. Hopefully, you all know how that works. <coughs> The big thing about TLA is the way that they do Booleans is the mathematical way. So in, in, in maths, you have a, a kind, of, kind of uppercase A is an and, and a kind of upside down A is, a, is an or. And that's what TLA plus it uses, forward slash and backslash. So if you look at the code, you'll see these forward slashes and backslashes everywhere. And all that is is and and or. Now, in programming, we use like ampersands and vertical bars and stuff. TLA plus does not use that. But it's the same, exactly the same concept. So hopefully, you already know how to do that. And then another big concept is something called a predicate. So a predicate is just an expression that returns a Boolean. That's all it is. Right? So in a programming language, I might say, here's a function with a, b, and c, and it's a and b, or a and not c. Right? So the whole thing returns a Boolean, and you just run it, and each time you get a different result. But it's a Boolean. That's a predicate. Okay? So TLA, I'd write the same thing in TLA like this. I'd say a and b, that's the kind of a, the letter a, uh, or, which is the upside down A, and then um, A and not C. So that's how you would write the same kind of piece of code in TLA. So there you go. That's, hopefully it's instantly a little less scary just knowing what those, all those forward slashes and backslashes mean. Now, actions, so state transitions. So you're probably familiar with state machines, but basically you have a bunch of states and you have a bunch of transitions, and that's how you model um, things. It's, it's a really nice tool. It's nothing, I mean, I use it for domain modeling as well. So here we can go from A to B, we can go from B to A, we can go from B to C, but we can't go back from C to B. And this model kind of captures that information. Very nice. So, you know, if you're modeling a chess game, you can model all this stuff. People take turns. But what's nice, you, know, you can see straight away from this diagram that when, when somebody goes to the game over state, you can't go back to playing the game. I mean, it's immediately obvious this, that transition is not available, right? Here's something for like a delivery of FedEx or something. Again, you can see that once it's delivered, you can't undeliver it. You can go back and forth in various other ways, but you know, um, that is this design does not cover that situation. So let's look at a, a transition in TLA. So in, in TLA, there's always a before state and an after state, right? So in this case, the state before is hello and the state after is goodbye. So in TLA, we would say state equals hello and then state tick equals goodbye. Now, every time you see the tick or the prime, if mathematical jargon, that means it's the after state. There's always a before, and an, in every single transition, there's a before and after. And so if it doesn't have a tick, it's the before. And if it does have a tick, it's the after. So that's what those little ticks mean everywhere. And this whole thing is an action. So I can give this a name, like this is the next action that you can do, the next transition you can do. So in TLA plus, I would write like this. I say next double equals. That's the double equals is not assignment. It's like you know, uh, defining definition. Um, 
So uh, the, the next operation is at the beginning, the state is hello, and, which that's the slashes, and afterwards, the state is goodbye. Right, so in English, we'd say, you know, before the state is low and after the state is goodbye. And that's the kind of formal way of writing this down. So this equal sign is not an assignment. If you don't think about programming variables, think about the state before and the state after. This whole thing is actually a predicate. This is true if the state is before and after, you know, like that, this is true. And if the state before and after is not like that, it's false. So this thing is actually a predicate. It's an expression which turns a Boolean. And you can, you can tell it's a Boolean expression because you can swap the order of the things. And it's the same answer. So it's not assignment. It's, it's more like pattern matching. It's like, is this thing true or not? And that's how the model checker works. So here we have our, our little uh, transition. And in the first case, this transition is true. In the second case, the, the, the after state is not right. So that does not match. That's false. In the other one, the, 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 uh, the, the before state doesn't match, and that's false too. So there's, you know, it's true and then false and then false. Like I say, it's a predicate. It was an expression. OK, now let's look at time. So TLA, the transitions go on forever, right? It's basically an infinite set of transitions. You start at something, and think of it like a clock ticking. It's like it goes from here to here and then here to here. And every time the clock ticks, you have to make another transition, OK? Now, because it's an infinitely, a, a infinitely long series of transitions, you can ask questions. You can say, is something always true? Is something ever true? Does it ever happen to be true that this thing, you know? Um, if something happens, must something happen afterwards? Can it, you know, is it, does it require that something happens afterwards? So that's the time thing. So that is everything about a TLA, right? So it's got its Boolean logic of straight transitions over time. And we'll talk about the plus later on. So that's the syntax for TLA. Now let's actually use it to do a very simple model, and we're going to count to three. OK, how, how hard is that? So here is our series of state transitions, right? We go from one to two to three. There's two, three states and two transitions. So we're going to model that in TLA. Now in a programming language, you would say x equals 1, and then x equals 2, and then x equals 3. Right, that's how you do it in a programming language. But we're not, make it, we're not going to do that in TLA plus. It's, it's going to be more complicated than that. So the first thing we need to do is say, what is the initial state? In the initial state, x is 1. And then what are the available transitions that we can do? Well, the first transition we can do is true. If We can do this transition if x is 1, and then afterwards x is 2. So that's a valid transition. Or... We can also do a transition if before x is 2 and after x is 3, right? So the initial state is 1, and then the first transition is the before and after state of 1 and 2. The second transition is the before and after state of 2 and 3. And then the overall, all the possible transitions we can do is the first transition, the first transition or the second transition, right? So the entire set of things you can do is, is the choice between those two things. All right, so that's how you get to three. Okay, it's very, very exciting. Now, let's just do a quick refactor. Um, you can take little chunks of code and give them names, which is nice. So here I've taken out these two transitions and I've given them a name, step one and step two. And now the, uh, the overall thing is step one or step two, which is a little easier to read. So these things are called operators in TLA. It's not like they're not little functions. They're actually more like kind of macros. They're kind of copy, you know, search and replace type macros. So there's step one or step two. So hopefully the, the forward slashes and the back slashes are quite, not quite so scary after all this. Now let's look at the, uh, the, the tool that we can run this piece of code or this model. So there's something, there's lots of different tools. The one I'm going to use is called the TLA plus toolbox, which is kind of an IDE. Um, and this is what it looks like. It's actually written in Java and it's about, it's over 10 years old. So it looks kind of ancient. It looks very unmodern. However, it does work, and uh, it works fine. So I recommend you use this if you're doing it. So here we have my uh, screen, and I basically paste my code in there, or type my code in there. And the first thing you do is just make sure there's no syntax errors. And then what you do is you create a model for this piece of code. And in the model, you say, what is the initial state, and what are the various transitions you can do? And that's what I've done here. You can just like tell the, tell the 
the model, what those things are. And then what you do is you run the model checker. So let me actually run the model checker. Here we go. Here is my, my code here. And here is my model. And I'm going to go run. And here it is running. Run, run, run. And it looks like I got some sort of error. It actually says deadlock reached. And if you look down here, it says it starts off at 1, and it goes to 2, and it goes to 3, and then it had some sort of error. All right? So what's, what's going on here? All right? Um, there are three states, which is 1, 2, 3, but we get this deadlock. So deadlock sounds bad. What does deadlock mean? <clears throat> um, what deadlock means is that, uh, and by the way, these traces are really useful. We'll, we'll see these later on. It basically tells you what it's trying to do, and so you can actually figure out. It's, this is the way you kind of debug this thing. You can look at the states and see where they are. So what happened is it got to three, and then there was nothing it could do after three. Now, remember I said these things are supposed to be kind of an infinite series of trans, uh, transitions? So it hit three, and there was nothing it could do. And it's, that's what a deadlock is. A deadlock is when you cannot make any forward progress. Like two, two people are trying to write to this file. Neither can write to the file. Neither of them can do anything. That's a deadlock. Right? So a deadlock just means nobody can do anything. And in this, state, you, in this case, you hit three, and then there's nothing you can do. So that's a deadlock. So uh, this, this little model deadlocks when it hits three. That's no good. So how can, how can we fix it? Right? We're going to have to th always think of these things as infinite series. Well, the answer is we just transition to three every single time. When we hit three, a valid transition is transitioning to three again, and then transitioning to three again, and then transitioning to three again. Right? So at that point, we can now have an infinite series of these threes, and these are all valid transitions. So if we add these as transitions, it can make forward progress. Right? It has not, it's not changing the state very much, but it is at least you know, moving forward along the, the, the series of transitions. So we're going to add that to the model. So basically, we're little, adding a, a little loop. On the, when, it, when it hits three, it can just keep looping around and hitting three over and over again. And there's a keyword in TLA saying unchanged. So this last one, I've added a new one called done, right? And the done step is when x is before, x is three, and afterwards, x is unchanged. Right? So it's basically x is still three. So when we add this to our model and we run the model, it works really well. Okay, so we run this, we don't get any more deadlocks, which is very good. So TLA is happy. Okay, now let's move on to the next thing, which is doing nothing is actually an, always an option when you're modeling a, a state machine. Because let's say that I'm ticking every second, I go, you know, I go from one to two, and then I go from two to three, and I'm just ticking along. Now let's say that I'm at one, and then a millisecond later, I, go to, I stay on one. I transition to one. Okay, and then the clock ticks, I go to two, and then a millisecond later, I go to two. And then clock ticks, I go to three, and a millisecond later, I go. This is exactly the same system. The fact that it didn't do anything you know, for a millisecond, this, it, you know, from a logical point of view, it's exactly the same system. You can't tell them apart. Right? So being able to do nothing is always, almost always a valid option. Right? So here, I'm just transitioning back to the same number again. So staying in the, same, in the same state is almost always a valid. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you don't want to do that. But in a lot of cases, it's really common that you want to do that. Because you know, things might just not, you know, they can just do nothing for a while. It's not a problem. So the word for that, the jargon word for that is stuttering. I Meaning it just kind of stays around, just goes around into a loop. So if you hear the word stuttering, that's what they're talking about. Nothing, nothing's changing. So now let's add stuttering to our little model here. So instead of being able to transition to two, we'll say, well, it can stay at one. That's all right. And then um, instead of transitioning to three, you can stay at two for a little bit. That's all right. That it doesn't do any harm. All right. So we've added a new uh, thing to our model saying it can either do step one, or it can do step two, or it can be in the done state, or nothing happens. And that's all good. So that's our, our model updated with stuttering, which, like I say, most models should have stuttering because that's the real world. All right, now let's do some properties. So this is where we are not, no longer, you think there's a lot of work to count to three. I could do it in a programming language in three lines of code. But what you can't do is the kinds of things that TLA can do, which is temporal properties. So let's look at these. So a property is something that applies to the entire system over time, not just to like individual states, but the entire system. We're going to make assumptions or, or, or predicates about the entire system. 
And these properties, again, like does it deadlock? Does it ever get to the end? <clears throat> we are really bad at doing this kind of thing. And programming languages don't do this either. And that's why you need something like TLA. TLA is excellent at doing this kind of thing. So let's look at some properties we can check in our system. A nice property is something, is something always true? Right? Is the queue always within bounds? Um, you know, is the, is the file system always active? Is the servers always online? <clears throat> in this model, we can say, is it always true that x is greater than 0? It's really simple. Okay. So hopefully it's true. Now, eventually true is a nice one. That means it's not true right now, but hopefully at some point we would expect it to become true. Hopefully, if we got a bunch of servers, we would hope that at least one of them would serve a file at some point. Uh, eventually always means that it gets to, eventually something happens, and when it gets to that thing, it's done, and it stays there forever. Right? So if you're, doing like a, if you're doing a server upgrade, you eventually get to the upgrade thing, and at some point the upgrade's done, and it's, and it's done. Right? Or in this stream case, we count to three. When we reach three, we're done. We're not, that's, you know, so eventually, always, it should be three. And then the last one is you know, the implication. If you hit two, does that imply that it's going to become three at some point later? So all of these things look like they should be true for our system, right? So how do we, how do, we do this in TLA? <clears throat> so again, in English, I'd say x is always greater than 2. Oh, sorry, I, that's a bug. It should be always greater than 0 there. So in mathematical terms, we have to turn it into a predicate. We have to say it's always true that this, that this, predicate, this predicate is always true. And the predicate here is x is greater than 0. And the always operator in TLA plus is this square brackets. Uh, the eventually, so instead, instead of saying at some point x is 2, we say it's eventually, this predicate eventually becomes true. So eventually the predicate x equals 2 is true. And in TLA plus, we use angle brackets for that. Uh, x eventually becomes 3 and then stays there. So mathematically we'd say it's eventually true that it's always true that x equals 3. Right? And we use angle brackets followed by square brackets. And then if x ever does become 2, then it should become 3. And so we say, if the predicate x equals 2 is true, that implies that at some point the predicate x equals 3 is true. And so we have the kind of uh, curly, wavy arrow. <clears throat> OK, so let's write this as code. So actually, I'm, rather than saying greater than 0, I'm going to say it's always within bounds. So always within bounds means it's always greater than or equal to 1 and less than or equal to 3, right? So you can see I've got the, the greater than 1, I've got the, uh, the and. Sorry, the or, the upside down a. So it's either greater or equal to 1. Actually, no, sorry, it's an and. Sorry, it's not upside down. It's greater or equal to 1 and it's less than or equal to 3. And the whole thing is with the square bracket. So it's always true. Eventually, eventually 2 is that x equals 2. Eventually, that's going to happen. So there's little uh, angle brackets there. Um, eventually, always, x equals 3. So when it does hit 3, it's always going to be 3 after that. And then, again, if x equals 2, then it implies that x equals 3 later on. So here's our three, and we just like, write this in the code. We just add this to our file, and this is something you can't do in a programming language, right? We add it to the file, and then what we do is we tell the model checker, check these properties. Are these properties always true? And let's, if we run the model checker, um, well, let's see. What do you think? What's going to happen if we run the model checker? Let me just go, let me just go over here and... Uh, Go to the next uh, poll here. If I run the model checker, how many properties will be true? All of them, three of them, two of them, or just one of them? Okay. There are there are properties there. Let's see what people think. Most people think that all of them will be true. It looks like. Okay. Yes. Some of them, three of them, two of them. It looks like most people think all of them are going to be true. Right, if we actually run the model checker, what does it say? It actually gives an error. So it's not true. It turns out that only one of them are true. Okay, because if you look at the, the trace, it says it goes to one and then it does stuttering, which means it stays on one. Right, so people forgot about stuttering. I told you all about it and then you forgot about it. So what it means is it starts at one and then it just loops back to one forever. So that's never going to get to two and it's never going to get to three. And even if it did get to 2, it could, it could just loop around on 2 forever. It's never going to get to 3. So both of these things, these states, you can just go around forever and never go anywhere. So we've just ruined our model. Yes? So uh, temporal property means true in all scenarios. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's just going to go around one and, you know, it's just going to start at one and just stay on one forever. So by adding stuttering, we've actually ruined our model. We had a nice model at work, and now we've broken it, okay? Now, and I said, but we should, we should have stuttering. So we've got a kind of conflict. We should have stuttering, but on the hand, as soon as we add stuttering, it breaks everything. So in this case, the, the only one that is always true is the always within band. So even though it stays on one, it's always true that it's between one and three, even though we've broken the rest of it. So let's fix that. What we really want to do is say, OK, you can go around a few times, but you should try some of the other ones sometimes. right? Don't just stay in an infinite loop. Like if, if you can go some other place, if you can transition to two, you know, every so often, give it a go. Don't always, always do the same thing and go in a, in a stay in an infinite loop. Right, so don't stay in an infinite loop. Try different things. That's called fairness. Right? Be fair. Like give each of the possible. If you've got two transitions you can choose from, Use both of them every so often. Like, don't always pick one and never use the other one. That's not fair. Right? Use both of them. So that's called fairness. Right? And in, of course, TLA recognizes this as a really important thing, and it has a concept where you can model this in TLA+. So how do we model it in TLA+. Well, I'm going to have to refactor the code a little bit. And the syntax, unfortunately, is a little bit ugly. Now we're getting into sort of the ugly syntax. So first of all, I'm going to take the spec that we had, and I'm going to merge the initial state and the next thing into one single uh, thing, which I'm calling spec. So this, this is the specification for the entire system. So it starts off as the initial and, then the next one is just always um, the next thing or unchanged. All right. So it's always either do always do the next step or leave it x unchanged. So that's our refactoring. Now it turns out there's a nice bit of syntax sugar. For this. So instead of saying next um, or unchanged, there's actually a little bit of syntax you can say with square brackets around it, uh, underscore x. Now it looks really ugly. Um, that's because it's not been formatted by LaTeX yet. Once it has been formatted, you have a nice little subscript. X would be a little subscript. But this kind of looks ugly because this is designed to be, you know, this is designed to be formatted code. It's not designed to be like programming language. So that's the syntax for try to do next or don't do anything. Now, now that we've got this syntax, we can actually add another piece, which is this fairness. WF underscore X next. So what that means is you can stutter a few times, but make sure you try doing the next. You know, don't, don't always pick the same thing. Try both of them. Okay? And that's called weak fairness. There's another one called strong fairness, which I'm not going to talk about. But weak fairness just means try things. When you, when you come to a branch in the road, try both of them. Don't always pick the same one. Okay, so that's what that means. Now, if we add that, so and we here we add our weak fairness to our design, and we have our bound our properties like we had before. With the weak fairness, if we run it, it does work. So the, we can we can have the stuttering and still prove that the various properties happen if we have weak fairness. So that's good. So I was you're thinking it's going to ruin everything, but no, it doesn't actually ruin everything. Weak fairness, you need to use this quite a lot sometimes. Okay, and this, these four properties, this is where TLA plus is not a programming language. You could not do this in Python or JavaScript. You couldn't say, are you sure that it will eventually become three? Are you sure that it will never go out of bounds? Programming languages can't do that, but TLA plus can. Right, now let's move to the next one. Let's uh, go back and model those producer-consumer ones, okay? And let's see if we can get some more confidence in that code. So here, we, here again, we have our producer, and it's, again, it's checking whether it's writable, and if so, it can write. And the consumer checks whether it's readable, and if so, it reads. Okay, so each one has two steps. So how do we model this as a state machine? Well, there's two steps. There's, there's two states and two transitions. So the first state is it's ready to start the whole process. It's idle, as it were. The first thing it does is check, is the queue writable? Is the queue not full? And if it is ready, then I can transition into a state where, OK, I'm just about to write. I'm ready to write my thing. And we're not doing this, like I say, we're not doing this as an atomic operation, because that would be too easy. Right? In, in the real, and in the real world, you can't always do it as an atomic operation. So am I, the first thing is, am I ready to write? And then if I am in that ready to write state, then I can actually write something to Q. And then I go back to being idle. Okay? So two state transitions and two transitions. So in a programming language, I would write the code like this. You know, if the producer state is in the ready and the queue is ready, you know, is less than the maximum, then I can assign the producer state to the next state. 
And then the second transition, I would say, well, if the producer is in the ready-to-write state, then change it back to the ready state and then also increment the queue size. Now, I actually don't care about the queue. I don't care what the contents of the queue are. I don't care about how the queue is implemented. All I care about is, is the, is the queue going to get too full? Is it going to overflow or underflow? That's all I care about. So I'm just going to model the queue. This is a model. It's not the real code, right? So I'm just going to model the queue as an integer. And every time I write to the queue, I'm just going to increment the integer. Every time I read from the queue, I'm just going to decrement the integer. And that's all I need to do. So that's the, that's the modeling I'm doing into this queue. I don't really care how the queue actually works. <coughs> so that's the programming version. Let's look at the TLA plus version. So again, before the transition, the producer state is ready and the queue size is less than the max. Afterwards, notice the producer state with a little tick next to it. Afterwards, the producer state is now in the can rate. And the queue size is unchanged. You have to say for every single thing, you have to say what happens to it. And in this case, for this one, nothing happens to the queue size. That's very important. Now, what about the, what, the right transition? So the right transition is assuming that before the producer state is ready to write, and afterwards the producer state goes back to being kind of idle, and now afterwards the queue size is queue size plus one. So I've just incorporated. So this is how you would write this stuff in TLA. So it's not quite the same as the programming thing. It's all, notice this is a giant predicate. Everything is an and and an or. Right? I'm not really doing any kind of calculations. So this, these transitions are only available. So for example, if the queue is full and a producer is in the ready state, the first transition is not available. So the model checker can't choose that transition because it's not available to choose because it's, it doesn't meet the requirements. Right? So these are, think of these things as predicates. Right? They always return true or false. It's not assignments. It's, if, 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 the, if the preconditions are true, then it can use this transition. If the preconditions aren't true, it can't use the transition. So if, there was, if, the, you know, if the queue, max queue size was zero, that would be a deadlock, right? The, 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 the producer could never transition between states, and the consumer could never transition between states, and the whole thing would just be a massive deadlock. So you know, if you have, an empty, if you have a zero-length queue, then you've got a deadlock. So. Now, the producer action overall is a choice between try to do the first thing, try to do the second thing. So that's, we've modeled the producer action as a choice, something or something. Again, it's the upside down uh, triangle. Now, we do exactly the same thing with a consumer. This time it's reading from the queue. There's two different states, there's two different transitions. So we check, the first thing we do is check whether it's readable or not. And the other transition is we can check, we try to write, oh, sorry, try to read. And when we read, we're just decrementing the queue. You can say queue size, queue size equals is minus one. We're just popping from the queue there. And again, the, all the possible consumer actions is we either do the first transition or we try and do the second transition. Right, so that's the consumer side done. Now let's put it together into an entire system. Let's actually, I'm just going to put the entire piece of code on the screen here. So that's the, this now is all the producer side of things here. Um, this is all the consumer side of things here. And finally, the overall, all the possible transitions we can do is either we can try doing a producer thing or we can try doing a consumer thing. That is everything we can do, right? So what's nice is we get non-determinism for free. Like if I was trying to model it in code, I'd have to have threads or I'd have to have actors or something, right? It'd be kind of tricky to model this but in TLA plus, it's just a choice. It's like, in when you're modeling, sometimes do the producer thing if you can, sometimes do a consumer thing if you can, and you can alternate between them. You know, the, the model checker will try all the possible combinations of doing these things. So it's just do one or the other, and now we've got non-determinism, because it will automatically, every time you have a choice, it will try them both, you know. Now, do we add stuttering, right? Should we add some stuttering where nothing happens? Um, maybe, it, maybe not in this case. Maybe this is a case where you don't want to have it. But if you did have it, you could, that would be an example where the consumer just stops working. So if the consumer stops working and doesn't do anything, does the producer keep adding things to the queue and overflowing the queue? Does your code check for that? You know. So maybe the producer just, the consumer's just not working, just taking time off for a couple of minutes and having a coffee break. You know. Right now, what are the, the temporal properties? So the first, the most important one, the most important one is, is it always within bounds, right? So is the queue size, 
um, non-empty, well, sorry, greater than or equal to zero and is the cube size less than the max. All right, so it's either that one or, sorry, and, you see the and and all stuff, it's either it must be greater than or equal to zero and it must be less than or equal to the max. And then we have the, the angle brackets, uh, sorry, the square bracket, which means it's always true. So this predicate where the, both of these things are always true. Now, if we run this script, we don't get any errors. So that means with one producer and one consumer, this design works. All right? We have confidence in this design. Now, I think that when I did this, the first poll, it was 50-50. Some people thought it wouldn't work. Some people thought it would work. Um, so with a single producer and a single consumer, yes, this actually does design does work. We don't need to guess. We're actually doing the model checking. So if I revisit this screen that I had before, and I go to the next poll, um, here we go. So now, how many people are confident that the single producer, single consumer one are, oh, everyone's confident. OK, very good. Yeah, so it was 50-50 before. And I think the confidence level is much higher, because I've run this little tool, and it's checked everything. And I'm pretty sure that it's not, it's not broken. Some people are still not confident that's correct. So I don't know, how would I persuade you? I would just take you through this in more detail and, and, and go through the model checking in more detail. But the answer is this actually is correct. So, right, let's keep going. <clears throat> um, now, now let's do the multi-version one with two consumers and two producers or more than one. And this is why we need the plus in TLA plus. So the plus is mostly set theory and um, Again, TLA plus uses a mathematical type of set theory. So for example, in programming, if I were to say, given a set, find all the elements that have this certain property, we would say something like set.filter, right? Something like that. Um, in mathematical terms, we'd say the elements in the set such that this predicate is true. So we'd write it in a mathematical way. And in TLA plus, we write it that way. We say curly braces, E, slash in, so just, it, again, LaTeX is going to format that as, as a little, um, uh, you know, Greek E, such that this predicate is true. So the, it basically, TLA turns this into like nice mathematical notation. And again, if I'm saying, is there any element in the set which has this property? In programming, we would say something like set dot any, probably, you know, I don't know. But in TLA plus, we'd say, does there exist an element in the set such that the predicate is true? So that's how you'd write it in TLA plus, and it gets converted into the mathematical formatting. When you run it through LaTeX, it formats it um, the other way. So there you go. Okay, so when you see that stuff, that's what's going. All these slashes, that's LaTeX formatting. Okay, so we need, a, it, since we're doing two producers, two consumers, we have a set. No, one, no longer just one, no longer um, just one consumer. So, now we're going to need the set part of TLA+. Plus. So here's a set of producers. We have two, probably good enough, P1 and P2. And we have two consumers, C1 and C2. Right, now how do we, we need to change our spec to work with multiple producers. So um, first of all, we need to initialize everything. So we're going to initialize the producer state to be every single producer is in the first state, in the ready state. Now you can think of, these, this set is actually uh, like a dictionary in Python or something, it's a, or a map, especially a bunch of key value pairs. So in, in Python, I could have written P1 colon ready, P2 colon ready. It means they're both ready. In um, TLA plus, you don't use that syntax. You say the set in, the, all, every P in the set producers, you assign it to ready. Okay, and the same thing with consumers. So these states are, like I say, think of them as dictionaries or, or, or um, maps. They are not just you know, the sets of key-value pairs. Okay. Now, let's do the writable side. Now, this time we're parameterizing by a, a, a particular producer. So this particular producer, for this um, transition to happen, this particular producer has to be in the ready state, and the queue has to be less than the right size. And now, afterwards, we're updating the state. Now, this dictionary, every single thing is the same, except for this particular producer is now changed. So the syntax is kind of weird. You say the, the producer state is exactly the same, except that this particular producer is now in the next state. But all the other ones are unchanged. <coughs> so that's why you see this kind of except syntax. Um, and let's look at the, again, I'm parameterized by producer, 
we check the state for this particular, so this is a dictionary lookup for this particular producer, and this is like updating the dictionary. This is the TLA way of updating a dictionary, rather than just assigning to the key. <laughs> um, and now we're going to do the right in the same way. Again, it's, the, it's got this thing where you update the dictionary for this producer. Now, we've got a whole bunch of producers. We can't just say do one or the other. What we're going to say is find any producer where we can do either of these actions. Like some producers might be in the middle of reading, some you know, writing, somebody, some of them might be idle. We're just going to pick one at random, try and find one that we can do a transition on. And again, we'll, we'll take turns. Because it's fair, we'll try each of them. Right? So that's how we do that. Same thing with the consumers, exactly the same kind of thing. I'm going to start whizzing through this. Like I say, don't worry too much about understanding every single line of code. I'm just trying to show you the overall concepts of how TLA plus would model this kind of thing. But again, we have a kind of a dictionary for the consumers. And if this particular consumer is ready, we update the dictionary and assign this particular consumer to ready to read. And the second transition is the same way. And then the consumer action in general is, does there exist a consumer that we can either read or, you know, or, 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 or check the readability for? So try and find a consumer that has a valid action that we can do. Now, if we run this script with two producers and two consumers, and that same always in bounds property, what do you think happens? First of all, all the possibilities of one is reading and the other one's writing, and this one, then there are two reading at the same time, and this one's, all those possibilities, the 38 combinations just with two producers and two consumers. Way, way too much. We, there's no way we can do a code inspection for that. Now, of course, this does not work. Okay, this, we are very confident that this design does not work. So when I polled you before, I think some people thought it might work. It's like, no, this, is, this does not work. Definitely doesn't. And some people weren't confident. Like, I am 100% confident this does not work. So we're not guessing. So how do we fix the error? Well, TLA Plus does not tell you how to fix it, right? You have to think. You have to find out what is the right way to model a producer-consumer. <clears throat> However, what it is good is testing the fix. So let's say I'm going to use a semaphore, or I'm going to use a mutex, or I'm going to use whatever it is that I think would fix this problem. I'm going to add the semaphore logic into my model. I'm going to rerun the model and see if it works. Right? So if, if, the model, if I rerun the model with semaphores and it works, I'm pretty confident that I could then go and code this with semaphores. And I got my semaphore logic right, which is always kind of tricky too. So you've got a lot more confidence that the fix will work or not. Maybe, maybe I got my semaphore logic wrong and it doesn't work. So either way, I've got some confidence there. So this is 50 lines of code, and we have a lot of confidence either way on the, on the design. So it's definitely worth doing, I think. Now, OK, last bit, which is TLA modeling. Um, uh, how are we doing on time? Using TLA plus to model zero downtime deployment. So uh, this is a real world example of if you're doing DevOps and you need to you know, do a zero downtime deployment. So I'm going to go even faster here. So again, don't worry too much about the details. But I just want to kind of show you that TLA Plus is a great tool to improve your design. Because what we're going to do is sketch the design. I'm going to, like, let's, think, let's try it this way. We're going to check it with the model checker. And the model checker is probably going to say, no, you got it wrong. We're going to fix it. We're going to try it again. And the model checker will say, no, you still got it wrong. Fix it, try again. And when the model checker says, I got it right, then it's like, yeah, and now I'm pretty confident that my code is good. Okay. So I'm going to steal this from uh, Hillel Wayne, who is a TLA. Uh, expert, and I'm going to talk about him later on at the end of the talk. <clears throat> so um, how are we going to, what, let's come up with our model. Okay, we have a bunch of servers, and each server is going to be upgraded from version 1 to version 2. But here's the problem. Each server goes offline during the upgrade, right? And we really want to make sure that there's always a server that's online, right? That's really critical. And here's another thing. All the servers must be upgraded, because a really easy way to implement this is to never upgrade a server then they're always online. So we have to have two conditions. I mean, you have to be very careful. Having them always be online is easy if, they, if you never actually bother to upgrade them. So you want to make sure that at the end of this process, every single server is at version 2. Right? So that's the extra little uh, kicker there. So how do we model this as a series of state transitions? Well, we're going to have three states and two transitions. Right? It starts off, it's online, and it's in version 1. And then we start the upgrade, and it goes offline. And then we finish the upgrade, and it goes back online, and it's now at version 2. Okay, that's our entire model. And then once it's at version 2, it can keep looping forever, right? It's got that little thing where it's done, 
and we can just keep going. So we have to add that to stop it having a deadlock, right? So again, we're going to have a, a, a dictionary of key value pairs and the server state in this case. The server state for each server is going to be one of these three things, online v1, offline or online v2. So initially, every single server is version one. That's the initial state. Now, the start transition is we pick a server, which is in v1, and then we upgrade to be offline, that particular one. And then to finish the upgrade, we pick a server that's offline, and we update it to be online with version two. So that's our start transition, and that's our finish transition. All right? And then uh, the, doing any upgrade is we try and find, does there exist a, a server that we can upgrade? So we try and upgrade a server, which means um, trying to do either the start transition or the finish transition. And there's also another one which is done, right? All the servers are in version two. So slash A means for all servers in set of servers, the server state is online. And at that point, we can leave the server state unchanged. That's that little backwards loop. So we have an upgrade step and we have the done step. So the overall uh, thing is either try doing an upgrade, and if we can't do an upgrade, try doing the done. Now, so let's run our script. Um, there are three states. Now, with one server, there's three possible states. With two servers, there's nine possible states. With three servers, there's 27 possible states. So for example, I could upgrade number one and upgrade number two and start number three, or I could do number one and go through all things and then leave these alone, or I could do this two steps forward and this one one step forward and leave this, you know. This, it's complicated. There's all sorts of things, all sorts of combinations of things that you could do, and you, you, you wouldn't really be, some weird combination might happen that you didn't think about. So it's too, again, it's too hard to eyeball. <coughs> so now what the temporal properties, so first of all, zero downtime. So what does that mean? Not all servers should be offline at once, okay? And then the upgrade should complete. That means that at some point, eventually always, all the servers should be version two, okay? So let's write that as a TLA code here. So zero downtime means it's always true that there is a server which is not offline, right? It's always true that there exists a server such that the server state is not offline. That slash equals is not equal. It's, instead of using bang equal, it uses slash equal. Okay? So it's always true there's a server which is not offline. Okay, zero downtime. Now, this eventually upgraded. Okay? So it's eventually all the servers in the set of servers will have a server state which is version two. Right? So we've modeled that in TLA+. Now, if we run this script with two servers, we get this invariant. Zero downtime is, vi and is violated. I thought, I thought we had a perfect algorithm here. So we look at the trace for the model checker, and it says at the beginning, S1 and S2 are both online at V1. We take uh, S1 offline, and then we take S2 offline. Well, boom, now we're both offline. We've, we've, we've broken our, our constraint. Well, that was stupid. So how can we fix that? How can we fix that? Well, we'll add another step. Okay? We're going to add a fix, but are we confident that our fix will work? Let's see. So what I'm going to do is add another, uh, a trend, uh, for the start upgrade, I'm going to say you can only start upgrading if nobody else is offline. Okay? So there's my start, my start upgrade. I'm going to add a new step. Um, is, does there exist another server where the other server state is offline? And if that's true, d don't, don't start an upgrade. Okay? So if somebody else is offline, you're not allowed to upgrade. So that's my fix for this problem. And now if I run the script this time with two servers, zero downtime actually works. We guarantee there's no downtime. Because there's, you know, if, if you can't start an upgrade if someone else is offline. So you can never have two people offline at the same time. That's great. Now the eventually upgrade fails. Why does it fail? Because of the stuttering. We haven't said, we can just say, stay in version one forever. Don't do, it, don't do the upgrade. How can we force the upgrade to happen we need to add this fairness thing. Like, if you can upgrade at some point, you must upgrade. You at least try upgrading. Don't just stay in an infinite loop and never upgrade. Like, if you can, if there's at some point in the system where, you know, everyone else is upgraded and you're the last one, you at least have to try it. Okay. So adding fairness then makes it all work. So that's good. Now let's add another condition. So you know, this is good. We're sketching our model. We're playing around. We're getting confidence now. Let's add a, a more strict condition, which is that all the online servers 
have to be running the same version. They all have to be running v1 or v2, but you can't have a mix, because if we have a mix of v1 and v2, it's going to mess up our clients. So how do we model that? Well, first of all, we define a set of servers which are online. So we say online servers are the set of servers where they are not offline. OK, that's easy enough. And now we want something which is always true. It's always true that for the set of servers which are online, if you pick any two of them, they will have the same server state. They'll both be v1 or both be v2. But they will not, they will not be different. So that is our same version requirement. That's our constraint for same version. So if we run the script with a new property, boom, we get an error. And then the, if we look at the trace of what's happening, it says, well, first of all, they were both v1. And then s1 went offline. And S, S2 is still V1. And then S2, S1 got upgraded to V2. And S2 hasn't even started upgrade. So now they're both at different versions. This, the first one is V2 and the second one is V1. And we, we didn't meet our requirement. So we have confidence that, that that fix did not actually work. Okay. Now how can we fix this? I'm going to suggest we use a load balancer. So the load balancer is going to only point to V1 servers or only point to V2 servers and you're not going to mix them in. So from a client's point of view, I'm only going to see the same version. So let's, how do we implement a load balancer in this scene? So the initial state is now I'm going to have a new thing called a load balancer. And again, from the model point of view, I don't actually need to implement a load balancer. All I need to do is say, is it version 1 or version 2? So it's just going to say, am I pointing to version 1 servers or version 2 servers? How that actually happens in the real thing, I don't care, because this is a model. I'm just doing the very basics, right? So the online servers are now slightly different. If the load balancer is v1, the online servers are all the ones which are v1. And if the load balancer is a v2, the online servers are all the ones which are v2. So that's, our, that's how we would model our load balancer. Now, obviously, the real thing is a lot more complicated. But from a model, this is, you know, this, we're trying to keep it simple here. Now, when can the load balancer switch from pointing to v1 servers to pointing to v2 servers? Well, it can switch when one server has been successfully upgraded. Or you, you, know, you could say maybe two servers. But you know, for this case, any, if any server upgrades to v2, I can switch the load balancer to point to it. Okay. So we now have a new step in our, in our finishing upgrade, which is if, if an upgrade is successfully finished, the load balancer can now be version 2. So now if we run the script with the load balancer, the zero downtime works. You never have any downtime. Everything is eventually upgraded. and same version works. So if I just run the code, I'll prove it to you. Let me go back here. Mm -hmm. now zero downtime. We open up the model. And you can see here is the code, by the way. So, you know, it's like 50 lines of code, it's not that much. Here are all our properties zero downtime, eventually upgraded. Same version, right? We take this model, we run it, <clears throat> and it runs it, and it's checking all the possible states and uh, no errors. Now, if you said I want the load balancer to always have at least uh, two servers, um, you know, which you might want to do, um, then you'd have to have, I've only got two servers in here, so it's never going to work. But if you had like model it with five servers, and you could say at least two have to be up at all times or something, you, 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 can just, you can see you could extend the model to do that kind of thing really easily. Yay. So uh, who thinks this algorithm is now right? I just ran the model checker, and it didn't give me any errors. Do you think this algorithm is right, the algorithm I just showed you? What is your confidence in the design of this zero downtime deployment process? Like the first one didn't work. And then I added various fixes, and I run it through the model checker, and um, this is good. So it looks like people, now there's a few people who are not 100% confident. Um, yeah, some people are not confident either way. But it's a lot more than it was at the beginning, where people were 100% people were not confident at all. So the people who are not confident either way, or the people who don't think it's correct, um, you know, Obviously, we have to go into more detail of this, but I think I could prove, I think I could, if I spent a couple of hours with you, I think I could convince you that this actually was a correct algorithm. Maybe not, maybe I'm wrong, maybe I missed something. Okay, so that's our sketch complete. And again, we just only spent 10 minutes on it. So you can actually think of it as sort of agile modeling, right, for concurrent systems. 
So we're doing some sketch, we're playing with some things, we're finding out certain things don't work, certain things do work. It's all about getting confidence. So the most common question, and I'm just, I'm sorry, a bit over, a few minutes over, I'm just finishing up now. The most common question people say, how do you convert this to code, right? The answer is it doesn't convert to code. It's not a code generator, it's a model. Just like if I have a wooden model of a building, it doesn't magically sprout and turn into a giant skyscraper, right? It's a model. It's a way for thinking about the building, but it's not the actual construction process. So it's, again, it's all about having confidence in the design before you start writing code. So that's model checking for you. Okay, so hopefully you can see that TLA plus is not actually that scary. The syntax looks a bit weird, but the whole thing of model checking is, is just a nice thing to have. It's not that scary. Um, you can, it's really nice for sketching things. In a few hours, you can actually play with it and get some confidence in your design. I would say if you're doing anything with concurrency, it's really, really important. I actually would say it's essential. And it's just another tool in your toolbox. You know, you know how to do unit tests. You know how to do um, type-driven design or whatever, or TDD or whatever. It's like, you know, these are just tools you have. It's another tool in your toolbox that I think, as yeah, so a professional developer, you should at least have some knowledge about. Now, TLA Plus is a really big system. It can do way more than I just showed you. I'm just doing a tiny, tiny piece of what it can do, um, but I'm not even going to get into that. So if you want more information on TLA Plus, there's a, pay, there's a home page, there's a videos, there's books, there's papers. There's a long book by Leslie Lampert. Um, it's a bit mathematical, but it's not actually that hard. Um, but if you want a more programmer-friendly thing, uh, check out stuff by Hillel Wayne. He has a book called Learn TLA. He has a website called Learn TLA. And he does trainings for pro programmer-centric trainings. So if you are involved in concurrency and you want to learn more, you know, obviously more deep, in-depth thing, uh, check him out and, and he'll, he'll do a training for your team. So um, I'm going to put the slides and video up here on my website, uh, f sharp for profit slash TLA+. Um, if you want more about property-based testing, I also have stuff about that. I have my book, which uh, people seem to like. And you can contact me on Twitter. And um, thank you very much. I'll be here. I don't have time for questions, but I will, I'll stick around here if you've got questions for me. So thank you very much for coming.